Hello, my name is Luke Johnson, and I'm building an educational company, app slash internet thing. And these are my pals, CJ and Jordan. It's been a while since the three of us have gotten together to talk about a text. And now we're going to talk about a text that was forcibly imposed upon many of us while we were in high school. We're going to be talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh tonight. Okay, so maybe before we get into it, I should ask Jordan and CJ if they have any sort of initial thoughts about this text. I, I selected this one, and um, how did you feel about my selection overall? Did you feel like it was educative? Did you find it interesting? Uh, am I off my rocker for saying that we, this is something that we should cover? I think it was great that you mentioned how this was something that we read when we were younger, mm -hmm. because I do recall reading it. Maybe not younger, but I remember reading it maybe last year or two years ago. But I don't think I got as much out of it as I did when we were preparing for this seminar discussion. So I think it gives a bit of advice maybe to anybody that really wants to get into a text. It's to read it once and then read it twice and then really research it if you want to understand it better or at least to glean some sort of knowledge off of it yeah so that, that's what i got from it at least and we're going to be doing look you there you have many options when you want to learn about gilgamesh there are a lot of established seriologists with very fancy degrees and stuff like that and you really should look to them to understand how this text came into existence and how to understand the sumerian culture babylonian culture and stuff like that mm -hmm. we're not going to dwell too much on that because there are too many minefields for us to mess that up sure what did well, you yeah, think yeah what do you think about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, CJ kind of took the <laughs> words right out of my mouth. I would say uh, undergrad Jordan uh, definitely did not uh, get as much out of the text uh, this time around. So, yeah, I would say that revisiting a text is always important. And, uh, yeah, it's, it makes it a lot easier when you don't have a paper to write on it the next day. <laughs> All, right. All right, so let's let's get into it. En enough of the uh, the preludes yeah. here. Okay, so just a little bit of historical background and and, and maybe CJ can add a little bit something there. I mean, supposedly this is one of the earliest surviving works of literature, depending on how you understand that word literature or book or whatever. It's about Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, and I think that roughly he is placed somewhere in the third dynasty of Ur, which would be about 2100 BC. Um, so the, the fragments of the uh, tablets date back to the 18th century BC and are typically called the Incipit. And what we're going to be looking over is the standard version from the 13th to 10th century BCE. And there are sort of 12 tablets recovered, although I did do a search yesterday and there was another tablet discovered where Enkidu and Gilgamesh are eco-warriors, but they're still translating it as far as I, mm -hmm. I know. So we're going to be dealing primarily with the standard Akkadian version in our conversation. I'm going to give a summary and then we've got three discussion topics that each of us have suggested that we're going to be talking about. Um, CJ, do you want to add any sort of concrete historical background to this before we jump into the summary? I think we just need to know that it's something that is still debated and like Luke said there's a lot of sources to get from at least for me what was really helpful was reading Will Durant's story of civilization and specifically our oriental heritage volume that had a lot with the origins of Gilgamesh but not only that but is it so oriental it, middle middle east as well it includes all that so middle east egypt even as far as Asia, he encapsulates all of, of those heritage. But I think what's really important is that he also dives into the culture and the civilization of the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians. So you get a bigger scope of what that world was like. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, he gives a brief summary of how the Epic of Gilgamesh came into our hands at least one of the sources that we have. So I would recommend reading that if you can grab it. And it's just a wonderful volume overall. So, uh, Yeah, and, and I think something that's kind of interesting here is that Gilgamesh's uh, status as an individual is uh, contested. Mm -hmm. But uh, interestingly enough, in uh, 2003, his tomb was found. Mm -hmm. But then this thing called the Iraq War broke out, and oopsie daisy, they lost it, and it, n it never was heard of again. Hmm. So that uh, that was really unfortunate. Um, 
but yeah, so let's let's jump into it. So this this first tablet, we find out that our uh, our, our primary character, our hero, if we can even call him that, is two thirds god and one thirds man, right? Okay, I'm not so good at math. Jordan, can you help me out with that? What does a two thirds fraction break down to in a decimal rec- uh, representation? Mm, point six. Six, six, six. Uh, yeah, it's a repeating six. That's very interesting. Um, and, you know, and I should state this, that there are certain people out there in the world that numbers are very important to. Ah, but moving on. Um, so Gilgamesh is not like the greatest king, right? He, uh, he's, doing, he's enjoying all the pleasures of being a king, but none of the responsibility. He's engaging in wrestling matches and tiring out the men. Some instances, maybe perhaps killing them. He's also maintaining this right where he gets to sleep with the brides before, uh, before on their wedding nights, before that they get to consummate the marriage with their husband and stuff like that. And so the people call out to the gods for help. And the gods respond by creating an equal named Enkidu, okay? And uh, Enkidu is this hairy primitive guy, and he lives with the wild beast. And one day, a trapper spots Enkidu and tells the sun god Shamash about Enkidu. And a plan is set in motion. Enkidu is tamed by the temple prostitute Shamat. And Gilgamesh simultaneously gets dreams about the arrival of a companion. Right, so they're trying to get they're trying to get someone that can challenge Gilgamesh, right? That can be his equal. It should be noted that there are some statues of Gilgamesh, right? right. That have him. He's, he's he's supposed to be this incredible hunter, and he's he's like he's holding like a house cat uh, lions, right? So I don't know, a lion is like five or six feet or seven feet long or something like that, approximately. So by scale, you can imagine these statues. Uh, representing a man that might be close yeah. to twenty feet tall, He's but giant. I don't. Yeah. yeah, I don't know where do giants come from. That's weird. Why would they? Why would they make him look yeah. like a giant? That's weird. I don't know. Uh, you should check out Genesis six four in the book Enoch if you're interested in that subject. Tablet two. Um, Inkadu learns about how much of a bad dude Gilgamesh is, and he fights Gilgamesh. Right. <laughs> Enkidu recognizes Gilgamesh's great strength, and they become the best of friends. They kind of fight to a yeah, they fight Mm -hmm. to a draw. And um, Gilgamesh, against the advice of Enkidu and the council elders, uh, determines that he and Enkidu are to go and slay the demigod uh, Humbaba in the cedar forest. Now, in the Middle East, I I remember on that that Lebanon is frequently associated with cedars or actually there's forests left there called the cedars of god or whatever hmm. that might be remnants of this very special wood uh that is there hmm. uh, so i think that they might be venturing to lebanon i'm not sure i'm not a seriologist i'm just trying to make sense of this thing tablet three gilgamesh visits his mom the goddess ninsun and she asks shamash the sun god to protect them ninsun adopts uh Inkidu and gilgamesh and leaves instructions on how to run uruk Tablet four, Gilgamesh and Enkidu go to the Cedar Forest. On the way, Gilgamesh has five dreams, and Enkidu does a little bit of uh, psychoanalysis, dream interpretations, and interprets them all as good omens, and then they hear Humbaba. Uh, Tablet five, Humbaba insults, threatens Gilgamesh and Enkidu, accuses Enkidu of betrayal. Gilgamesh defeats Humbaba, and Humbaba offers Gilgamesh kingship of the forest and to be his slave. Enkidu knows Humbaba is lying and tells Gilgamesh to kill him. Gilgamesh kills Humbaba and they bring his head back along with a bunch of cedars. Tablet six, Gilgamesh rejects Ishtar because of how she uh, treated previous lovers. Ishtar asks her father, Anu, to send the bull of heaven to avenge her. She essentially throws like a teenage hissy hissy fit. She's like, (laughs) give me the bull of heaven or I'm going to wake up all these dead people. It's also interesting that Ishtar's father, the sky god, Anu, is also the name of a telescope that is used uh in in australia it's the anu 2.3m uh telescope you should check that out it's uh searching for a bunch of stuff so anu gives in gives her the bull of heaven which a lot of people think is associated with the constellation taurus and the euphrates crack euphrates cracks open and pits swallow up uh 300 men Inkadu and gilgamesh slay this bull of heaven on offer the heart to shamash ishtar cries out and Inkadu throws hindquarters uh, of the bull at Ishtar. Uruk celebrates the accomplishment, but Enkidu has an ominous dream. It's taking me a while. All right. We'll just keep going here. 
Enkidu's dreams, uh, Enkidu dreams that the gods decide that one of them must die because they killed Humbaba. Enkidu is marked for death and curses the trapper and Shamat for taking him out of the wild. This is going to be important in our discussion. Shamash says, don't worry, Gilgamesh will bestow great honors at your funeral. And Enkidu is like, okay, that's cool. And he blesses Shamat. And then in a second dream, Enkidu sees himself taken captive in the netherworld by the angel of death. There they eat clay and wear bird feathers and they're supervised by some scary beings. Enkidu's condition worsens over 12 days and then he dies and laments that he could not die in battle because dying in battle would be like a super heroic thing to do. We're almost done. And we'll get to the really intellectually stimula stimulating stuff. Tablet 8, Gilgamesh gives Enkidu a lamentation, commissions a statue, gives grave gifts for the realm of the dead. Tablet 9, Gilgamesh now fears his mortality and seeks Upnapishtim to learn the secret of eternal life. This is going to be important. Upnapishtim and his wife are among the few who survived the flood. Very important. And the gods gave them immortality. He goes on a journey and ends up at the garden of the gods, which is full of jewel-laden trees. Okay, you can understand why I may have picked this text now. So tablet 10, Gilgamesh meets the alewife Siduri. She attempts to dissuade him, but sends him to the ferryman Urshanabi, who will get him to Upnatishtim. Upnapishtim. Gilgamesh destroys the stone giants that live with Urshanabi, but Urshanabi says you shouldn't have done that. Only creatures that would help him uh, cross the waters of death. Gilgamesh is going to need punting poles now to get to Upnapishtim. So he cuts down 120 trees. Upnapishtim ultimately reprimands him for trying to avoid the human fate, which is futile. So we get a little bit of this Ecclesiastes, uh, all his vanity here. Tablet 11. Okay, very important. Gilgamesh notices that Upnapishtim, uh, and, and, and he looks at him, he's like, we're kind of equals, but how did you get to be immortal? And Upnapishtim explains how the gods sent a great flood. And Upnapishtim was tipped off and was told to build a boat or an ark. Okay, and his family went on board and all the animals of the field right two by two terrified uh but what's interesting about this flood story is that the other gods in the pantheon that were hanging around in sumeria or whatever this time got freaked out and they retreated into the heavens okay so they got scared by this flood um ishtar and other gods lamented the destruction of humanity ultimately the boat lodges itself on top of a mountain and upnapishtim releases a dove a swallow and a raven. That sounds really familiar to many of the people who are listening to this right now. When the raven doesn't return, they get out of the ark and offer a sacrifice to the gods. Um, and these gods in particular are Enlil and Ea, Ea, I don't know, Ea. And en Enlil is mad at Ea for sending the flood and blesses Upnapishtim with eternal life, which is a unique gift. And Upnapishtim challenges Gilgamesh to stay awake for seven nights, but Gilgamesh fails and he departs for Uruk. As he departs, Upnapishtim's wife asks her husband to give a parting gift. Again, this is going to be significant. Um, he tells Gilgamesh there is a plant at the bottom of the ocean that will make him young again. Gilgamesh binds his feet with stones, gives himself cement shoes, and attains the plant. Intends to try it out first on an old man, because I guess he doesn't trust it, uh, when he turns, re returns to Uruk. Unfortunately, while Gilgamesh is bathing, the serpent steals it and Gilgamesh loses his chance at immortality. Tablet 12 is a little bit of a crap shoot. Somehow, like, Enkidu comes back. He's, like, in the nether, like, he's in the nether world, and Gilgamesh prays to get back his friend and his ghost jumps out and whatever. It doesn't make it. So, that, look, that's the standard Akkadian version. Okay, I'm sorry that I was so long-winded, but I think some people wanted the down and dirty on what that was, and they, now they have a general outline of this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, there. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let CJ and Jordan run the discussion for a little bit about the things that they find important. Sure. So I think the first thing we can start with is maybe what we've always learned even from our high school discussions about Gilgamesh, that there is this duality here between immortality and mortality that the second half of Gilgamesh is all about Gilgamesh trying to find eternal life because Enkidu has died. And at the end, we see that, okay, he doesn't get it. The flower goes from his hand from a serpent. And we think, okay, that's, that's that. But 
I think one part that's really interesting here is that throughout this second half of the text, or even a little before it, we have this idea of immortality not through a flower, but through deeds of valor and courage and works that are to be remarked about and remembered throughout time. And I think it would be good to just start with maybe just quoting some passages to elicit this idea. Please do, because I went through it very quickly. It's actually beautifully written. And, it is. And, and there are many things that you could quote from here. Sure. So what I'm going to really focus on is the two parts. So one is when Gilgamesh and Inkadu are about to fight Humbaba. And then the final section where Anlil, the god of fates and also the decreer of kingships, is declaring to Gilgamesh what his lot in life is, what his destiny is all about. So let's start with Gilgamesh responding to Freddy Cat Inkadu saying, Oh, well, don't, don't do it. He's, he's, Pumbaba is such a big, scary guy. So what Gilgamesh says is, quote, I have not established my name stamped on bricks as my destiny decreed. Therefore, I will go to the country where the cedar is felled, Pumbaba's place. I will set up my name in the place where the names of famous men are written. And where no man's name is written yet, I will rise a monument to the gods. So he's insisting on setting up his name where the names of famous men are written. And how did their names get there? Well, Gilgamesh is going to explain also to Inkadu how his name would get there even if he were to fall in battle. That it was okay if he died. So I'll quote... Gilgamesh further when he says then if I fall I leave behind me a name that endures men will say of me Gilgamesh has fallen in fight with a ferocious Humbaba long after the child has been bony in my house they will say it and remember so there's this thing where even if he dies in battle that he will still be remembered and it goes back to what you were saying Luke about how Inkadu was scared of dying without having it been through this courageous contest, right? Where if he wasn't, if he just died of illness, that's really nothing to say. Oh, look at Inkadu, that brave soul who died of, uh, 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 yeah, he just fell asleep and didn't wake up. It doesn't have that strength to it. As need to be immortalized in in battle. So this yes. has this has shades this has shades of Percy Bichelli's Ozymandias, does it not? Mm. Right, look at my kingdom, or the Fresh Prince of Bel Air theme song, yeah. whichever whichever <laughs> one you you're, you're more familiar with, right? Yeah, look upon my works. Yeah. All right, so uh, so he's not only immortalized in works, right? He's immortalized mm. in poetry, right? Yes. So this yeah. is. Presumably, we're talking about a guy that hunted lions in 2100 BCE, and we are living in the year 2017 <laughs> AD, or whatever the marking is, according to them. Okay, so we're talking about this guy uh, a lot later, 4,000 yes. 4, 4, years later. Am I, am I doing math right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's immortalized. He's, a he's attained a sort of immortality right now. We're putting him on tape, and many yes. others have, has, have as well, right? Right. Now... And now, is that is, a lot of people are striving for that sort of immortality? Mm -hmm. So let, let's maybe maybe it's worth talking about the value of that immortality, right? To be to be to do something heroic and then to be poetically remembered. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great, Gilgamesh is poetically remembered. Mm -hmm. What does that really amount to? Because uh, what I want to say here is think about how many of us, whether we know it or not. Our entire lives are about being poetically remembered. Mm -hmm. Right? It's very, very hard to get away from the idea of being immortalized in books, being immortalized in your ancestors' memory or in your um, children's memory, or or whatever. Many people think about what nice things someone will say about mm -hmm. them at their funeral or something like that. 
Is that significant? Jordan, what do, what do you think about that drive towards immortality? Is that something is, is, is that something you can understand? Do you think it ought to be mm-hmm. pursued? If, if what do you what do you make of this whole conversation? Yeah, that's the thing is because while reading this, I couldn't help but think about the Iliad mm-hmm. and the Odyssey and sort of thinking about those uh, Homeric epics, right? And so with Achilles, right, you have, like, he pretty much has this, like, you know, prophecy and he, he, you know, ultimately has this sort of choice of, okay, like, do I want to, you know, die and be immortalized and have people, like, sing my name through the ages? And he's like, and then especially after his, you know, lover Patroclus dies, then he just really, really is just like, all right, let's do this. Let's just jump right into this whole death thing. Mm. And it's interesting because with, you know, if you can make sort of the a, compare and contrast Achilles to Gilgamesh and Patroclus to Enkidu, right? They have almost like the opposite sort of reactions. Achilles just becomes enraged, just kind of becomes like almost like a raving madman. It's just nihilistic, like plunges himself to death, like let's do this, ready to go to the underworld. To the underworld. But Gilgamesh is like, oh my gosh, like, I can't go to that place. I'm going to do everything in my power to avoid it. But in, um, so in the Iliad, Achilles is like ready to go. Mm-hmm. But then interestingly in the Odyssey, when Odysseus goes into the underworld, he runs into Achilles and Achilles says, I would rather be a slave on earth than be the lord of the underworld. Hmm. That's an interesting inversion. Yeah. So, so so Achilles was divine, right? Or he was part of the god. He was part god. In so he some was kinda like yeah, too. so he was like kinda like Gilgamesh in the sense that he was like a demigod. So that, that plays into an interesting part of this immortality, right? Where like why should I strive for this? Mm-hmm. And I have to use an outside resource, and I will use the philosopher Hannah Arendt, who wrote about this beautifully in the book The Human Condition, which is a fantastic read. I'm still trying to understand it and work through it. But there's this part about immortality that she discusses in regards to the Greeks and Romans, but I think would be applicable to Gilgamesh, and it'll tie right into what Jordan is saying. So I'll quote the passage that I think makes sense here. By their capacity for the immortal deed, by their ability to leave non-perishable traces behind, men, their individual mortality notwithstanding, attain an immortality of their own and prove themselves to be of a divine nature. Now we have to remember Gilgamesh Two-thirds God, one-thirds man. And Anlil, I forgot to say this passage, decrees that, where he says, You were given the kingship, such was your destiny. Everlasting life was not your destiny. But, don't weep, because he has given unexampled, he's been given unexampled supremacy over the people, victory in battle, from which no fugitive returns, in forays and assaults, from which there is no going back. But do not abuse this power. Deal justly with your servants in the palace. Deal justly before the face of the sun. Now, it can be debated whether he does that, but there is this idea of living up to the divine in Gilgamesh, that two-thirds God. For Achilles, it's living up to what the gods have given him. And perhaps in this perspective, I don't I mean, in our secular age, I'm not really sure if we can say like, oh, I'm living up to what the gods have given me in the same way. But there's something about the deed, the immortal deed that I think like Hannah Arendt said, keys into the divine nature in that individual, whether it be Gilgamesh or Achilles. Well, what's, what's interesting? Oh, look. I, I think if I, I think it's problematic if we're. I, what's interesting is I think it, if I think it's problematic if we're living for a sort of immortality in the memory of history, right? Because mm-hmm. what difference does it make to you if you're dead? The only type right. of the only type of immortality that matters, right, mm-hmm. is if you get to continue living or you get to be resurrected as some 
Sure. <laughs> we'll still steer clear yeah. of that. But um, right, but Gilgamesh doesn't get any of that. Yeah. Right. No. He. Just, yeah. Right. right so, so I mean, if that doesn't happen, though, I mean, like Siduri says in the text, where he's like, you know, just like haggard. He just looks awful. He's like still in despair, and she says, you know, why? Why are you like striving for immortality, and why are you going on this pointless? treasure hunt right so she says Gilgamesh where are you hurrying to you will never find that life which you are looking for when the gods created man they allotted to him death but life they retained in their own keeping as for you Gilgamesh fill your belly with good things day and night night and day dance be merry feast and rejoice let your clothes be fresh bathe in water Bathe yourself in water, cherish the little child that holds your hand, and make your wife happy in your embrace, for this too is the lot of man. So what is So she, I mean yeah. so we have this divine nature, but there's also just like this like simplistic like humanness, right? The like the emphasis on human relationships. So do you think it's the opposite sense of the scale where there's people going for the immortal deed and then there's the other thing where you just embrace the mortality of the everyday life and of just the family and the yeah, that, simple things. Well, yeah, if, if you're denied that sort of immortality, eat, drink, and be merry is the only right, thing that's, that's left less, the... left to you. But what's right. interesting that I think about this is that we do have immortals in the story, right? We have these right. gods that seemingly go on living forever. forever. We have mm-hmm. Ut, Utnapishtim or whatever his name mm-hmm. is, right? But a lot of these gods with their immortality, right, don't necessarily... Become, are, are, they're not necessarily moral agents, right? Mm-hmm. And, right. and Gilgamesh is, is is a bad king at, yeah. at first, but then he kind of grows up. He goes through some sort of transition. We see a transition with Enkidu as well from a beast mm-hmm. to a civilized creature or something like that. So both the mortals in their story, their mortality seems to be linked with the ability to change and evolve. Whereas if you have all the time in the world, right, if you're, if you're eternal – you never really, it, at least in this story, we don't get the message that you develop, right? Mm-hmm. That you don't really make use of the finite amount of time that you have. Do you think that development then is a part of the divine, perhaps in I think it's Gilgamesh? For, I think it's in fact the mortality. The more, mm-hmm. it's the vanity. Mm-hmm. It's the vanity of trying to be remembered that causes you actually to grow up. Mm. But then, well, the, the, those seem, those things to be seems to be connected, right? Because obviously, you want to have a memory that is positive that endures, right? So, like, if you keep on living forever, I mean, what do you care what people say, right? But if you only have one life, whether it lasts for two hundred and fifteen years or however long Gilgamesh is supposed to have lived, I think you saw had some document that said he ruled for one hundred and twenty six years, something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, mythical or real, we don't know, um, but. I mean, regardless of the finite amount of time that you have, it's bound. It's finite. So you have to, you only have really one shot to get it right. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what's interesting about it. it, it but I think, I, I don't know. I don't know. We're, we're at the half hour mark. So I think maybe we want to bring Jordan's discussion question in unless, unless we want to keep going with this one. Yeah. Why don't we just keep going with this one for now? All right. I, yeah, I, I don't know if I... more of a footnote. Yeah. Well, no, I really, I really love how you bring up the alewife's part of, okay, well, why are you chasing this immortality? Because I, I, I don't know if I, I'm trying to understand if that's just a foil to this chasing of the deed or the work. And it's just like, well, don't, don't be like Achilles. Just, or don't be like Gilgamesh. Just, just sit back and relax. It's, o- it's okay. Your, your lot in life is to die. So just make the most of it i'm not really sure i mean i don't want to say that's almost like yolo if, if she's if if Suduri is giving us this babylonian euro a uh, yolo you know or it's just like what do you what do you make of that because you brought it up and i i thought it was great that you did i mean i think that and like this is kind of what i've been sort of pondering over is if this is sort of the, the babylonians um or Sumerians, whoever wrote this first, sort of figuring out their worldview. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that in this text you see, I think, humans trying to, like, relate themselves to the gods and try to relate mm-hmm. themselves to the animals, and you kind of see that between this juxtaposition between uh, these really organized, hierarchical societies versus, uh, you know, the sort of pastoral shepherding lifestyle compared with sort of the wilds of 
uh, you know, the grasslands that Enkidu was raised in. And I think that there's just sort of this sorting out <laughs> intellectually, I think, and emotionally of what it means to be human. Right. And yeah, and I think even it's interesting. Um, Especially see that with Enkidu. Why don't you dwell yeah. on that a little bit more? Because so just to recapitulate that for people, right? Enkidu was made to be this in- equal right. of Gilgamesh. Mm-hmm. And he starts off in this very primitive state. He's grazing in the field with right. the wild beasts. So he's eating grass. He has, you know, apparently no knowledge of cultivation. And and then he's seduced into yeah. civilization, mm-hmm. right? right. Don't, mm-hmm. The harlot, yep. right? Like begins to civilize him through sexuality and stuff like that right and then he becomes this member of this thing and he laments it because he tries to go back right exactly and he says and he's just like weeps because he realizes he says to Gilgamesh you know this idleness has made my arms weak right so he's he's lost his innocence yeah and and he's 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 got idleness now Mm -hmm. and he's also aware of his mortality right exactly so the question is so we get we get this tension between ignorance and knowledge, right? right? That seems mm-hmm. to mirror some of the aspects of the Adam and the Eve story, right. Adam and Eve story in in, in Genesis, right? So and so where, some... what do you think the yeah. moral is of that? Do you think Enkidu yeah. should never have been created? Should he have been left grazing? I mean, because if you think about it, though, on the whole, there should be a cosmic balance, right? So. There's all not all. I don't want to say always, right? Um, but so if there's these sort of acts of hubris, then I mean the gods get together with this council and they say, well, you know, they were throwing parts of the the bowl of heaven in Ishtar's face. Like we can't mm. have that happen. So there's always sort of this, you know, balancing and evening out in the end. So these sort of events that unfold may on a micro scale seem really chaotic, but on the whole it evens out. Oh. Yeah. And do you think that has to do with the polytheistic nature of the gods in some way? I remember we were discussing off camera how you connected them at least to the natural world, that they all all the gods in here seem to associate ones with the sun, or Shamash is the sun. Ishtar is for love and war, it seems. Anu is for the sky. And that they all interrelate, but they also just clash in different ways. And that perhaps... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of goes to show... Something. Kind of like the Homeric gods, right? Like, the, sometimes these gods can be just, like, outright petty, mm-hmm. extremely destructive and impulsive and just kind of flat-out scary, right? Like, those sort of, like, forces of nature... Yeah, I mean, the, just that they decide just to flood everyone. And that one of the gods happens to say, hey, psst, psst, hey, Utnapishtim, I got a secret for you. <laughs> like, what? Like, why does he even choose well, Utnapishtim? Well, now, now we have to be fair, because I think it's easy to bash on these polytheistic religions and say that it's crude, it's primitive, they're chaotic, they're schizophrenic, and da-da-da-da-da, and they do things but that they are totally... Are, but they are compassionate, though. So, I mean, yeah. there's sometimes with, like, Shamash, where... If, you know, the sometimes, like, you know, um, Gilgamesh will, like, pray in, in, like, tears. And it says, so Shamash accepted the sacrifice of his tears like the compassionate man. He showed him mercy. Mm-hmm. So this isn't just to say that these are just, like, forces of, like, chaos. But I think that um, this shows that the, the gods are much more complex. Yeah, and just the fact that they did give mercy to one individual rather than having everyone flooded as well. And I think it goes back to what you said, Jordan. Do you think of that cosmic balance that that there seems to be, even if there is this chaos underneath it all, there is a leveling factor? Yeah, like leveling and necessity. There's um, some scholarship that says that by necessity, Gilgamesh couldn't become immortal because they needed him to return back to Eric in order to transmit that information uh, before the flood before the flood uh, 
and then having his story and the flood story therefore like preserved in in the text. So Gilgamesh, Utnapishtim, and Gilgamesh are sort of furthering along some sort of divine plan, yeah. possibly right, so some sort of Sumerian. So is like sort of preserving the knowledge, but he's all the way out in the hinterlands. Oh. So by necessity, Gilgamesh needs to return back to Uruk in order to bring back knowledge to the people. Mm. So the, that's so there's this sort of this theory that. That's why they commit these acts of hubris. That's why Enkidu is kind of misinterprets these dreams because they're living in this age of kind of like ignorance. Okay. So that highlights what you said, Luke, right? Where you said their mortality, just the fact that they died, in some sense, gives them this push to Urgency. trans transmit this information that is immortal in some sense. Yeah, knowledge of the gods, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, can I can I do my thing? Yep. Okay, sure. Right, right. Well, I mean, we were speaking about the floods. So right. What right. did you All want right. to discuss? Look, this is what I think is most problematic, fascinating about this tale. Okay, so we need a little bit of historical context, right? So, Tablet Eleven and earlier intimations and tablets, I guess eight, nine, and ten or something like that, give us some tale about the this this parallel event to the flood that is recorded in Genesis. And it's, it's, it's a little frightening, depending on how you look at it, how much it mirrors that Genesis event. Now, okay, apparently, now this, this, this standard Akkadian version or whatever, we, we don't have the skills to diagnose exactly how all these cuneiform tablets came together. But whatever way you look at it, however way you mark it, it likely was written down and recorded before... Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, including Genesis. All right, and so people might be saying, who cares? Who cares? Why, this is why this is important, right? Because if, if this was written, I don't know, five, ten centuries before Genesis, right? That would make the Bible, on one hand, a derivative work. Something that, has, given this title, um, is it pan babylonianism right okay so there's this oral tradition that gets passed down and people will be like well why does that matter well that ultimately undermines and on one perspective the inspired nature of the bible and that it's be just simply being borrowed from folklore and mythology right. from others other situations okay mm -hmm. now other people say fundamentalist Christians or something like that, will look at this exact same situation and see it as a confirmation of the beliefs that they hold. Mm -hmm. But they have to tie themselves into a pretzel and say, well, see, the flood really did happen because it's documented in this other ancient text. So we have some greater reliability mm -hmm. of this thing that we believe in. But how do we account for it appearing before what Moses wrote, wrote down? So maybe we have to come up with this story, not unlike how we have to account for dinosaur bones, where the where the devil uh, time traveled and gave uh, advanced information to the Sumerians before Moses had a chance to write it down, or like put the dinosaur bones in the fossil records to make us all confused about God's inspired word. So the question that I have here, does the Gilgamesh story, if authentic, yes, I said it, and that's all I'm going to say, if authentic, does it validate, do you see it as a validation of the Genesis flood story, or does this ultimately undermine the entire Bible? Maybe you could do a third rail. Maybe you could say, well, Luke, what, what the Genesis stories and the Old Testament stories are, are mythologies, all right? And they, have, they convey a truth metaphorically. So it's no big deal that some other culture had a flood story that nearly mirrored what was going on with, with, with the flood story in Genesis, Noah, right? But then you have to make the claim that other aspects of the Bible are not metaphors, specifically the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That is not a metaphor, and that actually does have historicity to it. So on the one hand, you have to get you have to get yourself into this pretzel where you say, well, some parts of the Bible are metaphorical, where other parts of it are, you know, indefatigable historical fact. So what do you guys think about this? I my the temptation for me is to think that and that to be most academically honest, that this makes the Bible harder to believe. Hmm. If if I don't if I don't come up with some crazy way of understanding the historical situation or trying to interpret the text. 
Mm-hmm. My my gut reaction is is to not celebrate this as confirmation of the Bible. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? Because then I think you have to even ask, okay, if both of them are true, how does Gilgamesh fit in? How does Utnapishtim come in? And isn't it that some people believe that some of these characters were actually the same people? That, okay, maybe Utnapishtim There's and Moses, the, they conflate the two? Well, all right, so Utnapishtim would be Noah. Oh, I'm sorry, or, Noah. Uh, but right, a lot of people mix up Moses and Noah, yeah. right? So, so there you could try to make an effort to connect Noah and Upnatishim or whatever his name is, right? And there have been some efforts to try to connect Gilgamesh to Nimrod. Okay. In in the Bible, Nimrod, if if memory serves me correctly, is the individual who built the Tower of Babel. Okay. Right. If if I and tried to reach into heaven, if I can recall that correctly, I may be wrong about that, but I think I think there hasn't been enough of a of a. A connection developed among people in the scholarly community. Mm-hmm. Um, what's very interesting to me when I did look at the historical records of this thing is how really unsettled it is. Mm. It could be the case that we find out that there is earlier documentation. It's, it's a very unique practice trying to understand when Moses actually wrote the Old Testament. So I don't know, maybe there's going to be some evidence that comes about that says that the Old Testament ultimately is proven to be older than this in some way. I don't think that's possible, but um, mm. it, it, it seems like the situation is very fluid. Mm. Um, but I don't know enough about ancient civilizations. That, that's 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 all I have to say about it, really. Jordan, do you think that's what makes it so difficult? Because I think I'm trying to come up with a yes or no, but I think like what Luke said, just because it's so fluid, it just seems really difficult to even have an opinion about this yeah i mean i don't know i'm kind of always a a syncretist in that things meld together and play off of each other but Mm. i think that the tricky thing when we deal with you know early early sort of written texts is that and again i'm sorry to be a dead horse but with like the iliad and the odyssey right that when usually when these epics are written down and these stories are written down, they've existed in an oral tradition that extend really far back. So that's where the waters get money because we always put a place us sort of a premium right on written stories, but those stories go so much further back so then once you try to take into the whole scale of things then that's where it gets really tricky so, so if think, i may yeah. if i may quote montaigne um Apoke, like i suspend judgment on this one yeah so you think we're actually yeah. putting too much on the written down version of gilgamesh on the written down of when even the mm-hmm. first five books of the bible were written and not really taken into account okay when was it recited when was it even thought about or we need orally passed down we need to have an assyriologist on here to talk about that specifically we're not qualified to really say anything about it yeah but the thing is about the suspending judgment right Mm -hmm. and this goes back to our questions about immortality and mortality and stuff like that like if you suspend judgment on these issues right i mean do you suspend judgment on such other matters that could ensure your eternal life, right? Mm -hmm. If this causes you to suspend judgment on whether or not this undermines or supports the Bible, does this cause you to suspend judgment on ultimately making a revolutionary decision for Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. or any other or any other sort of faith tradition? And then you're just sort of lost in this molass of agnosticism. Right, right. So then you kind of get a distance from your cloud of suspension. Um, you know that that's a good question, and I would have to say that since I since I'm not like a biblical scholar, I would have to go. And the reason why I'm saying I suspend judgment on that is just because I would have to like go back and I would have to really like read the Bible carefully. Yeah, I think we all do. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Look, I I think we covered a lot of the things that I wanted to cover. Um, I. So I've said my piece about it. If you guys want to have any sort of closing thoughts about it, I think that'd be fine. I mean, I just think there's just so much we don't know. Just 
between us and I think just even in general about this work that I think we all have to do more digging and perhaps sometimes even maybe take some leaps of faith like yes. you said you know just to, just yeah. to say okay I'm going to try to find a, find a way even if it doesn't make even without the evidence evidence withstanding I'm going to make a leap and agree with things because I mean, we've done that with so many things in our lives and why not about the important matters too I yeah. suppose mm-hmm. yeah yeah um, and what I'm saying here about the Epic of Gilgamesh seeming to undermine the Bible and stuff like that, just mm-hmm. speaking from a purely academic perspective that it seems to do that, this is by no, no means a final judgment on the issue. Right. I think you no. need to question everything. I think you need to question mm-hmm. about how this text came into existence. I think you need to look deeply into this third way about how we can interpret some aspects of the Bible metaphorically and other parts mm-hmm. of it literally. That may be a very legitimate way to be- biblical exegesis, mm-hmm. except it seems sort of arbitrary and hodgepodge, but it seems to be the the way that most people who are religious today do it. They don't really take the Bible stories to be true. They don't actually mm-hmm. think that Abraham it's went up to Mount Moriah. They don't actually think there was an ark, that right. these things are morality tales. So it really sort of supports what's going on there in the popular culture. For me personally, I've moved more to a fundamentalist perspective. So I'm looking at, at it through that through that perspective. So this mm-hmm. this this text presents a problem to a newer biblical ideology that I have. So that's something that I have to wrestle with, but I'm telling you that I'm not going to be giving up on my Christianity because I read Gilgamesh. Mm-hmm. So don't, I don't want anybody to get it twisted here. Sure. But I think it opens up even for, I mean, Jordan, I don't want to mm-hmm. speak for you, but I think reading these texts in a way to suspend your judgment of even suspending your judgment, right? And actually saying, okay, well, I'm going to take away any disbelief and read this and say, okay, what if the flood happened? And if you can even just entertain those thoughts, it could take you to conclusions that perhaps you never would have went to in the first place. I don't know if you... That's kind of where it all starts, right? With the, well, okay, maybe. So what if this was the case? It makes, it makes, so in your guys' mind, it adds to the veracity of the Bible because it's making the flood seem that much more real because it has a corroborating source. Mm-hmm. Whereas for me, right. it's like it's mixing confusion in with that. Mm. You know? So it's interesting. Different people will look at this differently. It's a bit of a Warshot test. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. All right. That was good. I think we gave people enough to think about and they can understand the deeper meaning of this. Uh, perhaps we'll have someone who understands the history of this text and how it came to be in uh, into our... Uh, into our school curriculum. That'd so, be great. Anyway. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, yeah. Bye. And download the new app.